going around. And you know what that can do to your kidneys as well as to your blood flow, right? Um, and then the other thing is the, the behavior stuff. Yes, we always contribute that to the human ones. We know that everybody who has chronic pain often ends up having depression too. So if you can have that demoralization, any problems with like sleeping, you're gonna have behavior changes and changes in the CNS. Um, it'll be a bit harder to uh, figure that out in animals, but some extrapolation from the human um, knowledge is definitely important. So, so there's a lot of things that are happening with pain. So another reason from an ethical and moral standpoint of view, we treat any other disease, we do need to treat pain. It is just a little bit harder to do because it's not just a black and white antibiotics, yes or no kind of situation because we don't understand it. The problem really is we don't understand it. We know some parts of it, um, <clears throat> but only some parts, not the whole story, especially if it comes to chronic pain because the CNS changes so much with the constant um, triggering of any pain um, neurotransmitter, it's constantly unfolding, so we're figuring it, things more and more out. There's a lot of research coming out because chronic pain <coughs> in North America is a pretty much the number one demoralizing problem for humans. So lots of research is going in that direction. And probably, un unfortunately, <coughs> especially in veterinary medicine, there's no evidence, like no evidence for anything because we can't assess pain in animals very well. We have all sorts of scales and f weird methods, but we, we don't have a golden standard to say, I'm gonna use this one to figure out if this is animal painful. So you can tell me, yes, this or this might work or not work, and we're trying to understand why it may work or not work, but we have no evidence in it at all. We're just trying to understand it. So let's go back to that whole physiology. So the regular system, right, you're touching uh, something hot, you're withdrawing before it even goes to the um, brain, that's your normal motor reflex, but whenever that happens, it goes to the dorsal horn, that's where things are decided if it's gonna go to the brain or not. So, and that's gonna be the part that goes from the spinal cord into the dorsal horn. So when you look at the pain pathway, we have six different types. We have the transduction, that means we get a noxious stimulus. It always gets sent to the dorsal horn, which is the transmission. We have the modulation, where things get kind of like either upregulated or downregulated, excited. Do you have like an increase of an effect or a decrease in effect? That's where things are happening. The projection to the brain, and then the CNS kind of saying, okay, I feel a, brain, a pain. I feel a brain, I feel a pain. <laughs> Um, and then the descending pathway that again, which is very important for chronic situations, and that's where, for example, drugs like tramadol work is going back to the dorsal horn and saying, okay, um, there's more to it, let's modulate that up or down again. So that's kind of a circle that keeps going. We want to kind of remember, like, yes, under anesthesia, we put that perception away, right? So we can anesthetize anything deep enough that you don't feel the pain but all that pain nociception, that pain pathway that, that goes all the way up to the perception is still gonna happen. So once you stop the anesthesia, all that is totally upregulated and painful. So you really wanna treat anything before it happens to the brain. So that's one of the big things that always comes back, the difference between nociception and pain. So pain is actually being awake, realizing you are, something is painful in your body. Nociception is all that neurology, that physiology that's happening before you even realize it. So there's a wonderful book, Pain Management and Veterinary Practice. Um, it just came out. I don't have any part of it, so, but I'm still advertising it because it, it is very complete for acute chronic pain and it explains the physiology very well. So it's kind of what I just said about like just in different words and everybody likes different words if it comes to neuro. Neuro seems to be like this, too, the words are too fancy. So you kind of like just that again, the, the, the pain that gets kind of like um, recognized in the periphery, sent to the dorsal horn, and that's where it gets modulated, changed up, 
and then to the brain. And that's your regular pain pathway that's usually happening. And we'll go through some of that um, in more detail just for understanding with thinking where do the drugs work. So bear with me through that. Um, so we're trying to go through each one of those steps and always kind of keeping in mind this is where these different drugs work. All right, so the first one is the transduction, right? That's where the nociceptors in the periphery, wherever they all are, detect some sort of noxious stimulus. And the noxious stimulus is a stimulus that is, has a strong enough intensity to either threaten or cause any tissue damage. So it can be either mechanical, chemical, or thermal. Those ones are the different, usually, stimulus that cause any nociceptors to be activated. Nociceptors are like just peripheral nerve fibers, usually. So they have the dorsal, um, like the, um, they have a dorsal horn ganglion. They have the periphery that picks up the information. And then the central um, axon that goes into the spinal cord. So that's all there is to. There's a bunch of those ones around that go into the periphery. And just over there, these nerve fibers in general, there's two different types. And you've learned that in school a long time ago that we have the A delta fiber and the C fibers. The A delta fibers are the myelinated one. They kind of transmit that pain really fast to the dorsal horn, so you get it really fast in the brain saying, wow, that was a sharp pain. It's really painful, and so you can kind of see it has a big, big loop there, and I totally can localize where that's happening. The C fibers, they're not myelinated, so they transmit a little bit slower. So that's a kind of that dull pain that's coming from that somewhat direction, somewhere there, I don't, can't really pinpoint it, and that's kind of part of the chronic pain. The one we want, don't want to forget is the A beta fibers. So they're just in, for, in um, charge of touch. They're in actually in noxious. So, but they look very similar, right? Like, so they are bigger fibers. They're very myelinated too, so they have a fast response. But they're going to come back later when you kind of think about pain that, you know, when you start rubbing it. They are the A beta fibers that kind of take the pain away a little bit for a short time at least. So those ones, keep those ones in mind for later. So the endings of those fibers, they have like some sort of them, all sorts of receptors on it. And you do not need to remember them. Just keep in mind that, you know, when you look at serotonin receptors, sodium channels, so those are kind of things where some of the drugs are working. Am I in your way or can you guys see? You good? Okay. Um, but in general, the end of the nerve fibers are just sodium channels. So anytime there's a stimulus, it activates those those um, channels, they open up if that stimulus is strong enough, and then you have an action potential, a depolarization, and the action potential is going to send, be sent up that nerve fiber up to the dorsal horn. So look at that picture, right? So you have mainly the, the turquoise one, the sodium channels happening everywhere. It's all just the action potential sending up by sodium channels by kind of like sending things up. So the drug that works there, is lidocaine or any local anesthetic, and you can block anything going up there, right? So those ones, so that's why the local blocks are fantastic because they actually make anything of that, no of that um, pain pathway not even happening because you block it if you do your block right. But they only block it during the time the block is working. So if you have lidocaine, for example, it lasts about an hour or two hours. Bepivacaine lasts about three to four hours, right? So during that time, nothing is happening. But on the other side, you can't just rely on those ones because you're still going to cause the injury here. As soon as the block is wearing off, you start sending things up again, right? So you still want to do some sort of other analgesia. But if you're doing the time, like for example, the dental blocks, right? While you're kind of like trying to clean and pulling teeth, you don't have to keep them that deep. You don't have to provide so much other analgesia if you're able to block things off in the meantime. And then you just have to get the timing right, how long it works. Does that make sense? So then the fibers, these nerve fibers, the A delta and the C and the A beta, they go to the dorsal horn. And it doesn't really matter which lamina they go to, but when you look at it, like these fibers, they kind of like link to interneurons. Those ones are these kind of crazy things that are sitting there. And that happens like by all sorts of different receptors. 
So they activate those receptors and neurotransmitters are, are going to be um, released. And then either that pain signal, depending on the neurotransmitters, are going to be intensified or inhibited. And then they're going to get sent to the, um, um, to the brain. So the uh, main neurotransmitter in this area are like the GABA, pen like the GABA sorry, not gabapentin, GABA, glutamate, and the substance P, right? So those are very important um, neurotransmitters. So the excitatory ones, like um, the NMDA receptor that releases glutamate and substance P, makes everything worse, right? So you, instead of just having that one kind of like stimulus going in, you have all that GABA, like that um, glutamate starting to go around, and your pain is going to be exaggerated. Those are the excitatory um, receptors. And the inhibitory receptors would be the, the GABA receptors, the opioid receptors, and the alpha-2 receptors. So those ones diminish everything. So endogenous opioids, for example. So if you have lots of those ones floating around when you have your C-section or something like that, then your pain will not be quite as high as it usually would be, for example. So just an example. Um, so they kind of decrease things. So in this area is where the main modulation is happening. So where mo most of the things are kind of like going a little bit wacky. Um, and that kind of depends how intense your pain is and how chronic your pain is. So some of the factors that change how your pain is perceived there would be your inter inhibitory neurons, that big eye in there. So when we said before with the A-beta um, virus, if you're rubbing or you're doing a lot of massaging or you're doing like physiotherapy, you stimulate a lot of these A-beta fibers and that puts a little bit of an inhibition on the other fibers, the pain fibers that come in, and therefore you have a decrease in pain overall. Make sense? Other things that are happening are the endogenous opioids that we talked about. If you have those ones, and lots of those ones go around, then they again, like just they're sitting here, they de decrease the amount that comes from here and goes in there. So instead of like sending three signals that way, I say I'll just send one up there. I'm just going to diminish that part. Um, so they decrease the excitatory neurotransmitters. They say, you know what, glutamate, you're totally not popular today. Just get out of my way. Um, the other ones that we're going to go back to are the modulators that come back from the descending pathway. Remember when I said from the brain, it goes back to the dorsal horn. That's where all serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, all those kind of weird monoaminergic things are happening. They also will decrease that a little bit. Sorry. So those ones are the green and the red ones. They're going to be decreasing the effect coming back. Or they also can increase the effects. So once the interneurons say, okay, I got my signal, it's going to be sent to the brain. There are three different pathways. Clinically, it makes no difference. It's not really that important. And then it gets sent to the pain, uh, to the brain. Pain and brain, why is it always so close? The, pain, the brain, and then in the brain, it will be perceived as a conscious, like emotional, and subjective experience. So the International Association for Study of Pain, always, but you've seen that um, definition, I bet, a million times. It's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential da tissue damage or described in terms of that. And then to protect children as well as people in coma, people with Alzheimer's, even though you can't say you're painful or you can't point on that little scale, you still should get some analgesia because you still may be painful. This is a very human kind of like um, description, right? And we do have to remember this is very individual, a very individual kind of experience. Like when I look at my two residents, for example, right? Like so if I drop a book on Alicia's kind of food, she's going to be like, you dummy, why did you do that for? And if I do it on my other resident, she's going to be like, oh, wow, 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 which she's going to think like the whole bookshelf fell on her. So, you know, everybody's very, very different, and we know that from each other, right? Like, the pain is a very subjective, and it always depends what your experience was before. So, for example, if you had a lot of surgeries before, you experienced a lot of pain by breaking arms and playing hockey or whatever, your pain is different, female different than male, so very different 
different experience. And that is the same for animals. We know that we do a spay in one cat, you have a total different recovery than on the other cat. Yes, you're going to blame it on anesthesia and on ketamine maybe, <coughs> but it is often a different pain experience depending on what the experience was before. So for example, when I look at all you guys, and I'm going to watch your faces while this one comes up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, Mr. Tough Guy over there, he's like, so what? Like, why is he, you know, versus other words go like, ooh. But when I show Mr. Tough Guy, like, something he can relate to, he's going to be like, oh, yeah, I really don't like that. Okay, I'm not going to let you watch that one. But see how everybody is so different in that response, and that's just what you can relate to and what your, like, emotions are about that. So one big thing that always comes back to is like, okay, as humans, do we have the privilege of feeling the most pain? Huge debate. We can talk a whole hour about that one, right? Um, it might be a different perception, but I think by now we know that even an octopus can feel pain or some sort of pain-like status, because if he wouldn't, he wouldn't be surviving, right? We said that in the first slide. Everybody has some sort of stress response, pain-like response, even if you're a mosquito. So you kind of like, you know, but again, it's a huge debate, I'm not going to go into it, but we're coming off that hierarchy, no, humans don't always feel more pain. They show it more, they're wimps, right? So they show it more than a bird, because if a bird shows pain, it's not going to, it's going to be eaten, there's not a question about it. So um, we usually kind of like go for there. So the pain in animals, um, Maloney and Kent did a very good description for that, for the pain in animals, and I like that a lot. So an aversive sensory and emotional experience representing awareness by the animal of damage or threat to the integrity of tissue. It changes the animal's physiology as well as its behavior to reduce or avoid the pain, damage, to reduce the likelihood of recurrence and to promote recovery. All right, so now a bee doesn't have a long memory. He might go back after 30 minutes and through that fire, but in general, in these first 30 minutes, he will avoid it. So this kind of like covers a dog to the octopus to a bird, right? So it's a very good description for um, animals, I find. So how come that we always say it is so subjective and it depends on earlier experience? Where does that come from? So let's have a closer look at that modulation again. So we know that the, and then like, that's the last part, and then you guys are free of that part. So we know that the brain and the spinal cord is a very active and dynamic system. It doesn't stay stagnant, right? We do remember things, we learn things. It needs to keep going, but that also means it changes with experiences and with pain. So the nervous system will alter all its functions um, in response to any of the, anything that comes into there. So, and that ha change just happens totally constantly. So, and it depends on the intensity and, and that chronicity, what the brain is doing about it. So, if you have constant perturbation of that brain, of that um, pain center, it's going to get, okay, something, I'm just going to change something here. You start getting high peripheral and central sensitization, which can lead to allodynia, and hyperalgesia. And you guys remember that hyperalgesia and allodynia, right? Hyperalgesia means you have an increased response to a stimulus that is normally kind of painful. It's that Andrea kind of version, right? That like uh, there's a whole bookshelf on my foot rather than, you know, it's just a book. So, so that's kind of, that would be a, a hyperalgesia kind of a little bit out of control with your response, in my mind, but for her, this is an actual painful response, right? Um, and I can say that I have five knee surgeries, so my kid make, knocks me like an, against the knee a little bit, I'm always like, not swearing, I'm not swearing, but <laughs> it is painful. So secondary hyperalgesia, it means that the primary hyperalgesia, it's actually at the side where you have your injury. You have an exaggerated response there. The secondary hyperalgesia is the surrounding area. It starts to kind of move around. Yes, you don't have any wound there, but you still are extremely painful. Um, allodynia is something when you touch something that shouldn't really be painful, suddenly is exaggerating painful. And it's kind of typical that 
we always see the little white Maltese. So you, you just touch them for putting like a catheter in. I'm like, that shouldn't be painful, but he's painful everywhere, right? They're like, like, they seem to be like super sensitive to pain. And Carol Matthews always said, it's the white fluffy dogs. They seem to have more pain receptors. I'm like, I'm starting to believe it. So looking at that graph again, right? So innoxious means it shouldn't be painful, but you have a pain response. Noxious, yes. Hyperalgesia would be Andrea. Normal is, is um, Alicia. And analgesia is you give them some wine to drink and they'll be fine. <laughs> so the peripheral synthesis is ugh, sensitization that we talked about. Um, usually, if a, pain, if a stimulus is short-lived, the neural response is short-lived, right? It goes away very quickly. But if you have high intensity or a very chronic stimulus, that can lead to that high, um, sensitization in the periphery, mainly a lot there first, but also centrally. So that hyperalgesia is just an overreaction of like anything happening in this area. And then your low threshold that usually shouldn't really cause anything, sorry, the high threshold that usually takes a while to get that stimulus actually going, turns into a low threshold. It only needs a touch to actually be painful. Make sense? And that is because of a lot of neurotransmitter going around. So anything in the periphery there is starting to send, like from macrophages, from maybe to all sorts of weird cells, sending all sorts of um, neurotransmitters out. Histamine is a big one, serotonin, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, nitric oxide, substance P, everything is in that periphery going, making everything worse there. And that results in an increase in excitability of your nerve fibers, right? We said there's sodium channels. It takes us through a certain threshold. But if you make it worse, and then things lower down and you're more excitable and you send more things up to the dorsal horn. So we call it the sensitizing soup. And that's where your NSAIDs work, right? Because you have your prostaglandins, you have your leukotrienes, you have your norepinephrine and serotonin maybe as well. Um, but mainly the prostaglandins are a big part of that, and that's why your NSAIDs do a good job to decrease the sensitization there. But when you have all this one already happening because of chronic something, then again, your nociceptors are way faster to fire and send things up to the dorsal horn. So the central part is more that diffuse pain sensitiv um, sensitivity and just increase pain severity, like just like overall, just this dull kind of like constant pain happening. And again, it's a lower threshold. Everything is just way worse. And that is because there's all sorts of um, pain, neuro, astrocytes, um, things that kind of start moving into that field and seem to, like when you have those inhibitory interneurons that you had in the dorsal horn, they start to be active. That a better fibers that we said is just innoxious and it's just for touch suddenly starts being like, okay, I'm part of the pain party here. I want to be like totally in it. They start to be painful now suddenly too. This is all kind of the neuroscience kind of like putting all everything being very active in there. And that's when, you know, the pain isn't even related to any certain stimulus anymore. It doesn't really need to be a certain intensity or anything or a duration, it's totally out of nowhere when you have this phantom pain or sudden pain out of nowhere. Diabetes pain is a uh, typical example for that one. Um, the usual central sensitization that we see um, just for acute pain is that what we call wind-up effect, right? Um, so when you have an increased activity, um, you, you, you have a, a sudden, like, very intense um, pain stimulus, and it keeps going. Like, for me, the, the tika, right, the chronic ear in inflammation, they have ear inflammation for, like, months or if not years before we decide to do a tika, like a total ear ablation. So you have this chronic pain there going, and then you suddenly cut into it. It's a huge kind of, like, change there. Um, so the, that repetitive um, stimulation of that chronic pain that's coming releases the substance P, and it actually, usually, that um, NMDA receptor sits in the dorsal horn and goes like, ah, oh, there's a pain coming, I'm too lazy to even move. I have that magnesium, it's a very stubborn um, molecule in there, it doesn't move unless it's a very intense or very frequent repetitive stimulus, then it's going like, okay, magnesium is out, the um, NMDA receptor is activated, 
And suddenly, instead of having just one stimulus going to the dorsal horn, you have like a tenfold going up to the brain. That's what the NMDA receptor is for. So instead of like, it's just totally exaggerating any pain that's coming up. Um, there's other contributing factors that, that are part of this windup. The NMDA receptor is a strong one, and because we can block the NMDA receptor with ketamine, methadone, um, amantadine, it's a nice one that we understand. But there's all sorts of other stuff that contribute to it. So there's like loss of the GABA. Remember, GABA was the inhibitory part. Um, controls, there's some nerve changes, calcium. Um, re um, receptors are a huge component to it, and we only say my understand it, I'm not going to go into it. But there's all sorts of other components that are part of that. The NMDA receptor is always the one that we, we can actually understand. So that was the spinal modulation, and the only one we have we're missing now still is the supraspinal modulation, that descending pathway. And I'm going to quickly go into it because that's where gabapentin and tramadol work, right? So, um, so the descending connection between the CNS and the spinal cord, like that can turn into a vicious cycle, right? The green is the inhibitory um, pathway, so it says, you know what, you guys are totally overacting down at the spinal cord, just slow it down there. So he's just going to send norepinephrine, serotonin down there to kind of like slow things a little bit down. On the other side, there's that evil little thing in there that still goes, no, 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 you guys keep it up, the party is good, so let's keep the pain going, and it's going to send more down to make the pain even worse, and it's going to go back up, and then you have the reflex again going down. So the part who's um, in charge of that one would be, as I said, the serotonin, norepinephrine, all that monoaminergic, but also opioids, prostaglandins, um, and the alpha-2, so those are receptors that are part of that kind of thing. And the therapeutic drugs that we use for that descending pathway, cannabis is a huge one for that because it works very well on that one in a medical way. Opioids, alpha 2s, the serotonin, and that's where I said like the tricyclic antidepressant, serotonin has a huge role in the brain. Um, gabapentin, NMDA blockers, as I said, ketamine, um, <coughs> um, amantadine and methadone, and the calcium channel blockers like gabapentin. They work on that area. But remember, like the, that descending pathway is usually upregulated when you have a chronic pain, not so much when you have acute pain. So you kind of understand now that you have a very much a continuum from physiologic or adaptive pain to maladaptive or pathologic pain, right? So, yes, the reflex pain is the easiest one. It's a short lift, it's done. Surgical pain, coming a little bit further down. And then cancer pain, neuropathic pain, chronic pain is way down here, and that's a much harder one to treat. So if you do surgeries, keep it up there. Keep it up at the surgical pain. Don't come, don't come down this way. Keep it up here and, and treat it right away, right? So what are our options for treatments? Okay, you made it through the physiology. I'm very proud of you. Nobody even asleep. I like it. So, one more time. No, just a good joke. <laughs> but you know, like now you kind of know where they kind of work, right? For acute pain, we usually use NSAIDs and opioids. You're going to know where you're going to treat them, right? In the periphery is where your NSAIDs work, but you have some central effect too. So, but when you look at, a, at an animal per se, you kind of have to consider his history because we said whatever happened in the past is going to change. So this one was actually a really excruciating painful MPL. We were like, it's not a big deal, where's the problem? But he just couldn't control his pain. Um, so you kind of have to remember how long has that pain been going on? When you do TPLOs, has he just ruptured his cruciate last week? Or was it three months ago? So three months ago is already kind of starting to be chronic, right? So you might already have an upregulated pain pathway. Okay, here's like a third foreign body you're going to pull out of his belly. So, okay, how many surgeries did he have before? If he had those surgeries and his pain wasn't really controlled, you have an upregulated pain pathway, and this dog will going to need a little bit more than your usual one that hasn't had any pain to them, right? Um, so did he had previous surgeries? Makes a huge difference. 
And then consider the cause of pain, like how severe does this dog seem to be? And yes, we're extrapolating. To me, like a fracture, it looks pretty awfully painful. I can't watch surgeons. I find it really, like, it makes me cringe, right? Because I find it, like, just it causes me pain. But we, do, we shouldn't extrapolate. But we don't have a good assessment of, yes, that Labrador should be painful, but he's just looking at me and wagging his tail. So is he painful or is he not painful? How am I going to assess that, right? But we have to try to figure some way out to like assess that pain and then kind of say, how much analgesia should I give him? Was it non-existent before surgery? The spay, they're always happy and healthy. You give them hydro and they puke, right? Because they're not painful. The opioid receptors are going like, what did you give me that one for, right? So versus when you have a fracture and you give them a good dose of hydro, they're painful you see lay, way less of those side effects like vomiting. You do still see the odd ones, but in general, give a painful animal an opioid, you don't see the side effects. Um, and then, yes, what kind of pain? Is it inflammatory? Is it cancer pain? That's another big one. We do a lot of CTs and to kind of look at what's going on, but we're like, say, it's a CT. We're not doing anything painful. I get it. We can give butorphan. That's fine with me. It's a cancer pain. It's been painful for quite a while. We might have not recognized it, but maybe he should get actually something better just to kind of like shut down a little bit on that pain pathway. Does that make sense? Um, the principles, yes, preemptive. If you can treat it beforehand, you're way better off. And then because you know now the pain pathway somewhat, um, you want to use it from different angles. If an opioid is enough, that's great. But if it isn't, what else can you do? So, and it makes sense. You've seen that graph probably a million times. Um, so if you do not, if you preemptively give analgesia, you won't get, and usually you get an injury, you have a pain, and it slowly tapers out. You give the um, analgesic before the injury, you won't have that hypersensitivity. You might have a little blap of pain when it wears off, but you don't have this hard to treat hypersensitivity. If you give it when you think, oh, I'll just give it when we actually start surgery or like just after, then you, yes, you're gonna diminish during the time the analgesia works, but you still have an upregulated pain pathway causing um, hypersensitivity. So you wanna treat it early if you can, right? Um, that kind of prevents or minimizes any of that wind-up or the peripheral or central sensitization that we were talking about. So treat it early, nick it in the butt. Um, it also improves post of analgesia, obviously. You just need less at the end of it, right? And that's what we want. We don't want to give them a million drugs. We want to send them home, ideally. Happy ta wag-tailing, right? Tail wagging, wag-tailing, oh dear. The other one we need to remember the emotion center and the pain center are really closely linked. Yes, all of you and all of our technicians can place a catheter without giving a pre -mats, But that's not the point. You really want to try to decrease any stress and fear because stress and fear, like we always bring up that example, you love your dentist because you think he's great and you're not scared of going, you're fine. You don't have any pain. If you're already scared going to a dentist, you usually have more pain after. Emotion center, pain center, really closely linked together. So you really want to try to decrease any stress. Give him a sedative. What's so, there's no really side effect. I mean, yes, there are side effects, obviously. But there's no real disadvantage of just taking a little bit of the anxiety away so that the dog is not so upregulated. Anything upregulated is upregulated in the central compartment. It's going to make him go worse with the pain after. So you do really want to decrease that. And if you look at humans, yes, it's hard to evaluate in, in, in animals. But cognitive um, behavioral therapy is one of the number one thing for chronic pain in humans, right? Relax a little bit. Do a little bit of yoga. Things get better, right? So yes, we can't really do that. With animals, we can't really evaluate it. But just use your common sense. Give them a little bit of a sedative to make things a little bit easier. They're scared coming in your clinic. Yes, your clinic is cool, but it's still scary for them. They're out of their normal routine. The other thing that I always like, because I like blaming surgeons, because I'm an anesthesiologist, is like, you know what? The more, the longer your surgery lasts, the more you mess around in there, 
You know, when you just do your first two surgeries, a space and neuters, and they take about an hour or two hours, they're going to be more painful. So as, if you can diminish that one, perfect. You've got really good tissue skills, you're fast with what you're doing, then mm. your pain will be not quite as much. Okay, I had to do that for the surgeons. Um, the other principle is what we said, the multimodal approach, right? Um, so if you can interrupt the pain pathway from different um, receptors, that'd be great, from different angles. Doesn't mean everything needs to get MLK. Doesn't need to be. Like if you, if, if you really want to do it individualized, but it is warrant in many of these um, procedures that you're doing. If you don't get anywhere with one drug, start using a different drug and see if you get anywhere with that one. And there's all sorts of ways you can do that, right? You kind of look at the pain pathway again and see where does what work. Um, and then you kind of go, okay, let's start with the basic one, which would be the opioids, right? So opioids are the number one that we use for intra-op, pre-op, and post-operative analgesia. Um, local anesthetics, as I said, do your block if you can. And then, you know, if things don't go well and you're really struggling, then figure out, like, what else can I do? Can I do ketamine CRI to block the NMDA receptor? Can I do lidocaine CRI? Um, but let's go back to the opioids. So yes, they are most commonly used, and we know they're in the periphery. They're everywhere, right? Opioids receptors are everywhere. They're in the periphery, they're in the dorsal horn, and inhibit the transmission big times. They're also in the brain, and they also help with the descending pathway. So those ones are very good drugs to use. Always remember, though, that um, opioids, all the different agents work very different in different species, and they work very different on the different individuals. You all had the dog that really <coughs> wasn't doing well on hydro. He was going all dysphoric, although he should be painful. The, uh, some other dogs just kind of, you seem to have to top it up every two hours. The other dogs, you top it up every six hours. Everybody is different. It's different species, different individuals when it comes to pharmacokinetics and um, dynamics. You do want to use the opioids preemptively, um, and we use it commonly for premedication beforehand because then you get a little bit of sedation, you can place a catheter, things smoothen out. And you should use it as soon as a painful animal comes in. There should never be a sign like this one. Yes, a dog will bite. There should not ever be a sign of being, I made it up, but we don't have it. But you should not have a painful animal in your clinic. Right? So you really want to, like, any time there's a painful animal come in, give him analgesia. Yes, there's always that neuro exam you're supposed to do if he is painful. Do it quickly, then give him analgesia. You want to get the pain under control as fast as you can. Um, you have different options, and most people probably have hydromorphone. Is that what you're using? Yeah. So morphine, hydromorphone, um, oxymorphone, um, methadone are the usual full mu agonist. Um, hydromorphone, we all like it because it doesn't cause quite as much vomiting as morphine. Morphine is dead cheap. It's really nice to have, and it doesn't work maybe a little bit less, but in general, very similar. Oxymorphone was great for cats, but we don't, I don't think we have it in Canada, do we? No. That's a real bummer. And same with methadone. Methadone is really hard to get in Canada. It's a great opioid, not quite as long working. Um, but it is an NMDA blocker as well, right? So you have the opioid and the NMDA blocker right in one. Um, so that is a very popular drug in Europe and um, US now. Um, and then the very strong mu agonist like fentanyl or remifentanyl. Fentanyl is very short acting but it's a strong opioid. So if you, have, if you can't figure out, for example, in chop, if your dog is painful, a little bolus of fentanyl and see if everything kind of smooths and snaps down, then you know it was the pain. It's a good one. Um, and because it is so short acting, you don't start accumulating if you can't. You, you just figure out it is painful and then either put them on a CRI or not. We'll get into that. Partial mu agonist buprenorphine is a it sits really tight, it has a high affinity to the receptors, um, but only has a partial effect. So the analgesia is not quite as well, 
but for a lot of other procedures, it actually works great. Uh, just like, you know, like the very the fractures, you can't really top it up. It makes it a little bit more tricky. But it is a good option for cases that seem to have like just a moderate um, pain status. Butorphanol, I'm not a big fan, I'm sorry. Like you can use it for radiographs, take radiographs with it. It's nice additive, but for if it comes to pain, it's very short acting, right? Like how long does it last? Like maximum 60 minutes, about an hour. So you're anywhere between 30 minutes and 60 minutes. You don't even get, I mean, maybe you guys are really good and quick with your procedures, but you, you haven't even started your surgery by then. Um, and then it is only for mild pain. Um, it, it antagonizes any mu activity. So if you give it and you want to give a full mu agonist on top of it, it kind of antagonizes it. it can't, you can't really get them together. So from a pain point of view, not ideal. From a sedative point of view, totally, it works great if you want to take you know, radiographs or something like that. But if you do surgeries, probably not enough analgesia. So if you use it preoperatively, um, always kind of like usually if you do surgeries, we start with a full mu agonist. I think it's very important. You can top it up easy, you can titrate it, and it works well um, for any pain you have. Intraoperative um, opioid use, the question is always like, okay, so I gave it about two hours ago, we're not quite done with surgery, it starts to be reacting, what do I do? Do I top it up? Do I ride it out? Because, you know, it usually lasts four hours. So the question is always where to balance. I don't want to overload him because then he'll going to wake up dysphoric, right? So if I give him more than he needs, but I want to give him enough. So you kind of have to figure that out. So we usually go a half dose of our initial um, hydromorphone dose and top it up if we feel he needs a little bit more. He seems to be quite responsive. So you titrate it to the individual. You don't always go, okay, it's been three hours, I definitely have to top it up. If he's still fine and his epidural is working, you might not need to top it up at that point. But on the other side, if a dog after one and a half hours, because for whatever reason seems to be very responsive, top it up then, give him a little bit more. But you have to balance it on a very individual kind of timing. The other option would be if you can't control it to put a fentanyl CRI on it. Um, Remifentanil is another one, it's very short acting um, but not very commonly used because it's fairly expensive. The problem with the CRI is you need some sort of like syringe driver, right? You're going to put your drug in there and give it very precisely. You can also put it in a bag, like for example lidocaine, and drip it to effect. It takes a little bit of math and it's a little bit annoying, but if you have a little um, table around or you're very kind of good with that, it's a great way if you can't, if you don't have one of those syringe drivers around. Um, so that's a good thing. The only thing you always want to remember Anytime you give a CRI, a constant rate infusion, you want to give a bolus, right? Because otherwise, it takes about four and a half half-lives to get to the level of therapeutic level where you want to have it. So if fentanyl has a half-life of, let's say, 45 minutes. Take that times four and a half. I can't do math, but it should, it's definitely much longer than your surgery should be, right? So five hours, you should be done with your surgery. So you really want to give that bolus and then it kind of all levels out. But if you don't do that bolus, you might as well not really use it because it'll take way too long to get there where you want to be. And that counts for all the CRIs you're using, lidocaine, morphine, hydro, fentanyl, ketamine. You need a bolus beforehand. The alpha-2s, those ones are always the ones that, you know, we're kind of afraid of, but they are pretty good analgesic, especially in conjunction with the opioids, because they work synergistically together. They kind of sit together. They're kind of like a little old married couple. They are everywhere together. Um, and they work synergistically. So they work in the periphery, they work supraspinally in the dorsal horn, and centrally, and on that descending pathway. Same as the opioids, right? Um, it works, they do have sedation, which we don't always like, but sometimes we do. Um, the sedation is fairly short-lived, um, and you have the cardiovascular side effects. The problem is, just because you give a high dose or a low dose does not change your cardiovascular side effects. The cardiovascular side effects are not dose-dependent, right? So you can give a tiny dose of alpha-2, the so hydrate still is going to drop down. So you really want to kind of like, it really doesn't matter. That's the only problem that we're struggling with. The, um, alpha-2s, and that's why we're like usually a little bit afraid of it, but 
they are good analgesics, especially for breakthrough pain that we can't control. Um, you can give a CRI intra-op. Most of the time, we actually use it post-operatively when we have one of those cases that we don't seem to control. The question always comes up, so well, all you're gonna do is sedate him so he's not gonna like, you know, complain about his pain anymore. And I, I don't know the answer. Maybe that is part of it, you get a heavy sedation. But he's sleeping, he doesn't really seem to care about his pain anymore. I don't think you're really masking it. I think you still provide analgesia while you're giving that, as well as taking that anxiety away. Remember back then, like if you were sleeping, all that fear and anticipation what might happen and that yapping is going to go away. So you're, you're relaxing. So maybe not a, bit a bad idea, but something to keep in mind. In comparison, if we do give ACE just to get him out, you don't really do anything for the pain. You do get him sleeping, but you don't provide extra analgesia. Um, the other thing is alpha 2s work really well for, because opioids, especially fentanyl, when you have or morphine, when you give that at a long time, at high doses, you get that hyperalgesia from that. So you get analgesia to start with, but then it seems to be either tolerance or humans kind of actually say you have exaggerated pain from that. And alpha 2s as well as ketamine kind of like take away of that. So that kind of is helpful too. We talked about the local blocks, um, so there's specific nurse blocks, remember, sodium channels, there's no action potential sent up if you're doing it right, um, so you kind of block that transmission, um, and there's all sorts of specific nerve blocks. We'll go through a couple, but not all of them, because uh, we can talk a whole day on that one. Um, it decreases the amount of energies you're using. You need less opioids if you can block that pain um, going up to the dorsal horn. You also don't need quite as much of anesthetics. And when you do a lot of dental, you, you see a lot of old dogs, right? You see all the side effects that comes when you have your isoflurane pretty high. The vasodilation, the blood pressure, you're not like really having a hand on it. So if you can decrease that a little bit, your dog will be better off after. Um, especially if it comes to the cardiovascular side effects. So local anesthetics are very, very helpful. But do remember the duration. Often, if I do, if you know, if your dentals take a while and you only use lidocaine or bepivacaine, do one beforehand and do another block at the end of it. As long as you don't overdo with a toxic dose, you have a longer duration for postoperatively. So, but you still need to address the analgesia, the systemic analgesia, because that block eventually will wear off, right? and you, stand, you still have the periphery that is all inflamed and you want to block that effect. So declaw blocks, dental blocks are usually, epidurals are very good, they're easy to learn, um, and intratesticular blocks, we'll go through it. So dental blocks, very easy for the infraorbital. Infraorbital blocks anything from that first premolar, the canine and the incisor, so if you pull one of those ones out, it's an easy one there, it's easy to palpate, and you usually, depending on the size of the animal, anywhere from 0.5 to 1.5 mils just at that area. Um, maxillar blocks are a little bit more trickier, so you kind of find that, you're gonna find exactly this little area and go into this area. So go direction there, and they're all well described, um, but they kind of block all of that, right? The infraorbital only from here, this one, is going to be all there. So that'll be your maxillary block here. So you kind of have the injection there, that direction, and it looks a bit scary because it feels like you're poking into the eye, but it's an easy one. Just practice. Practice on um, skulls. I don't know, cadavers? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but once you get good at those ones, they're easy to perform, but you need to get over the threshold of like, okay, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to practice and it'll be fine. And then the better you get, the easier they perform and then they're totally part of your regular routine. Mental ones, they're easy ones to feel here, but remember, they only block the incisors pretty much. The canines often go too far back here when you pull them out and they're not often blocked by that. But even that helps. Bless you. 
Intratesticular, we always go like, ah, oh, be way faster done before I even do this block. But it's such an easy, fast one to do, and it diminishes all that systemic, sy sympathetic kind of response that you do when you pull on the testicles, right? We're back at the intratesticular block, so an easy one to perform. You just pop the needle in and give a certain amount of volume depending on the size of the testicle. It gives you a huge benefit intraoperatively as well as postoperatively. Because um, even though we always think they are not very painful, they do seem to be fairly responsive. Um, cats, because of the tiny the size of the testicles, you can easily put a little T in front of it. Um, that kind of like cuts down the, um, sp uh, the cord. Um, some people still put a little bit of um, bipivacaine or lidocaine into the testicle as well. Um, easy one to perform, it makes a huge difference for that upregulation, right? Um, epidurals, you've read the technique, you probably do most of them. Anything in the hind area, especially if it comes to hit by car, fractures, anything like that, put an epidural in. And if you don't know how to use them, you're always welcome to come to OVC and spend a day and practice if we do have epidurals. <laughs> or just kind of like, you know, go to those um, courses. There's a lot of advanced local anesthesia courses in all sorts of conferences, the OVMA, the NAVC, anybody has all those different um, local block um, courses. So if you're not very kind of like, I'm not one of those who kind of says, I'm just gonna try it and we'll see what happens. Lots of us are, so lots of some of us are not. So then just take one of those courses, they're very beneficial because you will decrease all that pain that goes into the dorsal horn. Um, there's all these fancy um, blocks out there. I'm not even going to go into it, but if you're interested, there is a lot out there. The other thing that we seem to be using, instead of just doing a local anesthetic block and really blocking it, is systemic lidocaine. And you would just kind of give an IV dose of lidocaine and put them on a lidocaine CRI. Lidocaine is really cheap, right? Like it's not even controlled. And it seems to provide some analgesia for certain pain. It's not really well understood um, how it works. Um, but in the human side, it seems to kind of decrease that spontaneous impulse generation that happens, especially in the dorsal horn and in the CNS. And it works very well uh, from like when you have injured nerve fibers, upregulation of the pain pathway. So it suppresses all that somehow, but we not 100% understand how. Yes, it'll be the sodium channels because sodium channels are in the brain as well, as well as the calcium channels. Um, it seems to work, when you look at the evidence in the human world, the visceral pain is the one it works best for. And I usually kind of always come with the argument, yes, I might not know if the evidence is there for the analgesia in animals, but it's a prokinetic. So if you have GI issues, you have GI surgeries, use it because it works for the prokinetic part, especially when you do colic surgeries, right? Um, but also it seems to work for neuropathic pain in, in humans. They use it for chronic pain. The only problem is it has the side effect of nausea. So it's come out of style because people don't like being nauseous, right? And we do see that in ICU too. When we give too much lidocaine, the animal gets nauseous. Intraoperatively though, it seems to help a little bit. It helps because it also is a sedative. So you can decrease your inhalant um, and then you decrease the amount of analgesia. So if I feel like, you know, my opioid is not quite cutting it, I don't really want to set up a ketamine CRI, lidocaine for, for, like for GI procedures, laparoscopies, or some sort of breakthrough neuropain seems to be working well. But if you want to kind of do the discussion about evidence, no, there's no evidence for that, and we don't understand it very well. Ketamine totally makes sense, right? Like it's not a good analgesic by itself, but for anything that's chronic or already has a very painful, like any cancer pain, anything where you're like, you know what, he's been chronically painful and that NMDA receptor is firing um, um, pain signals to the brain, I can block that by putting on a ketamine CRI. So for anything, like for example, the ticker, any back pain, anything like that, it actually works quite well. Um, very useful as a CRI. Again, because it is, um, it goes in sub-anesthetic doses and such low doses, 
you kind of, the best way to give it is it by a syringe driver instead of in a bag because you can easily overdo it. And you know, it, like you've seen the um, cats especially waking up on ketamine, but even if you put them on a sub anesthetic dose and it starts accumulating over time, um, you get that twitching and that kind of rough recovery which you don't really want to do. So most of the CRIs, because most of our drugs are fairly long acting and have a longer half life, you want to titrate down at the end so you don't have so much on board. Lidocaine, for example, if you keep it at a high level to the end, you're going to sit there for half an hour to see if he's going to wake up. He's just going to snooze it out. So usually we're just going to decrease it and then keep it at a level that you feel like, okay, he's awake enough, you still have some energetic effect, or we'll just take it off even. Like lidocaine in horses, 20 minutes before surgery, you want to wake it up, I would take it off because you're gonna have the very slightly ataxic recovery. So I usually kind of be a bit careful about that. NSAIDs, you all know about NSAIDs. It's a an an non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It has anti-nociceptive, anti-inflammatory, anti-pyretic, anti-endotoxemic, and all sorts of other properties that are really beneficial if it comes to analgesia. They're great analgesics. Um, they work, like you guys know, by blocking the ar arachidonic acid, turning into all those pro-inflammatory and pro-anything else um, um, enzymes. No, those are the enzymes. Those ones are the neurotransmitters, so leukotrienes, prostaglandins. All of them are somewhat pro-inflammatory as well as um, have some other um, activity. We always start... COX-1 is the one that's all the good COX and it's making sure that our GI and our kidneys are good and COX-2 is the bad one that's only upregulated when there's pain and inflammation. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. It was nice when we thought that because then we'll just do COX-1 you know, one sparing and COX-2 selective, but now we know that the COX-2 also has you know, gastric um, repair function and if we totally block it off, we still see the GI issues and still see the kidney issues. Prostaglandins are just a very complex thing. They have a lot of functions. So, you know, we just have different um, NSAIDs working on different receptors. So still kind of like have some hard time understanding the central effect of the prostaglandins. But in general, the NSAIDs work very well um, because we know the COX are increased in the area of inflammation. So if you can block it there, you don't have that much of redness, pain, and inflammation happening, which is very good. Um, upregulated and chronic issues, and um, so if you do have the NSAIDs, you decrease the inflammation at the site of the injury and you prevent any of that peripheral hypersensitization as well as some of the central effects on the prostaglandins, especially if it comes to acetaminophen. Um, preemptive is, again, is ideal, right? Like you want the inflammation not even to start happening. But some of the um, drugs, and I think because we're getting very worried about the side effects of the NSAIDs, we always say, let's give it at the end of the surgery. Doesn't really make any sense. You wanna give it before the pain happens, right? Before the inflammation happens. But certain cases that have GI issues, kidney issues, you're worried about hypotension, you probably want to be a little bit more careful and make sure everything is at a good stage before you give the NSAID. So certain cases you will have to wait, um, but most cases it'll be great if they're on it. So you kind of have to balance out your advantages and disadvantages. So the question always comes up like, do I need to top them up? What else do I have to give them? How am I going to assess the pain intraoperatively? So uh, it's a bit of a hide one, right? We don't really know because he, like, he's not telling me. He's anesthetized. So you're going to have to figure that out. Um, what we always still kind of hear a lot is like, well, his heart rate is not up. He's not painful. Heart rate is not a good indicator for pain, unfortunately. Um, it might, it may, might increase when blood pressure and respiratory rate goes up too, but heart rate by itself can totally have other reasons why it goes up. So not a good indicator of pain. If he's starting to move, if the surgeons start cutting, probably a good indicator that he at least is too light. <laughs> but then, you know, it's still hard to figure out if we have him at a good plane what is your response? So, so then you're going to go back into, okay, what do I know about the pharmacodynamics and ki kinetics of the drugs? I know buprenorphine in cats should last six to eight hours, 
But if the pain is more than my moderate pain, it might not be enough and I have to top it up. Um, with hydro, or even buprenorphine and docs, much shorter acting. Lamas and alpacas, even shorter acting. So you don't, can't just extrapolate and say any species, it lasts six to eight hours, right? So we kind of have to understand the pharmacokinetics of that. So you need to really do mo a very good job at monitoring and figuring out the trends. Like you kind of, okay, everything went well when we didn't do anything, and now the heart rate and blood pressure and respiratory rate, everything is, seems to be coming up because we started cutting. Then you go like, okay, he looks deep, he has no blink, I gotta do something about that. So the trending is a very important part of assessing pain intraoperatively. Obviously, it's easy to just kind of bombard them with analgesics, but then you're gonna be struggling with post-op stuff, right? So you'd, like your post-op recovery, like the immediate assessment, when he wakes up, if he's still painful, is not quite as hard as the intraoperatively one, um, but it does still depend on like, what's his personality? Was he total spaz beforehand? Probably you didn't change his behavior, he's still a spaz when he wakes up, so is he, you know, just very excitable? Is he totally disoriented because he's an older dog and he just doesn't know where he's at? Is he dysphoric or is he yapping around because he's really painful? So then you kind of like go, okay, what was his personality? What did we do to him? What's his breed? What is his age? Like, as I said, older dogs always wake up dysphoric, like, oh, they're not dysphoric, disoriented, right? They have cognitive di dysfunction disorder, so most of them, so they just are very out of their limbo and they totally feel like, I, I can't handle that, and they often wake up crying, and you don't really know, is it pain or is it just him being an old funny man? Um, also consider what's the temperature. If they're shaking and pulling everything down, they're contracting everything, yes, they might be pulling back their leg that is painful, but they also just <coughs> might be cold, and giving more analgesic is not gonna help with that. But pain, um, cold temperatures also contribute to pain. Cold temperature will definitely make it more painful, so you wanna take care of that, either with an analgesic and warming him up. My techs always make fun of me because I express every single bladder that comes out. So, but on the other side, you guys all know how it feels when you're in the middle of the night, you don't wanna get up, but your bladder is actually painful, right? So you're like, okay, make it more comfortable. Anything you can do to make things more comfortable with a dog coming out of anesthesia or in a human, like, you know, having everything cozy and cuddly and not a full bladder, um, makes things way better for the animal. So the question always is, so when they are waking up crying um, or thrashing around, is it dysphoria or pain? How do you differentiate? That's always like a very hard one to figure out. Are they actually responding to you or are they kind of like spacing out <coughs> seeing aliens, yapping very monotone something around? Um, and then what I usually think the best one to evaluate that is the manipulation. If they do that monotone kind of crying, you touch their back leg because you did pr procedure on them, and they turn around, you know he responded to that. He felt what you were just doing. If you gave an epidural and you can touch his toes and nothing is happening, but he's still yapping away, then you're like, okay, I probably overdid it with my opioids, and he's very dysphoric. But if I'm not 100% sure and I can't quite differentiate between the two of them, I usually go, okay, let's start with a sedative and figure out, like, um, ca like, can we get rid of that, like, going crazy? Most of the time when they're totally upregulated, just some ACE is not going to cut it. Uh, first of all, it's not an analgesic, and second, it'll take a lot of ACE to get down, and then you know they last six to eight hours, you gave them a lot of ACE to get them back to where you kind of want to have them, you're going to sleep it out for the next day or two. So you don't really want to do that. Um, Dexmedetomidine is a good one. If you really can't handle and he's about to bite everyone, just give him one microgram per kilogram of dexmedetomidine, get everything back to normal. Yes, you will have a drop in hydrate, and then start over again. Figure out if you squeeze his leg, is he responding to that? The other option is if you do have fentanyl around, it's a very good one because it's a strong opioid that only lasts 15 minutes, right? So if you give it to him and he totally goes like, oh, yes, I can sleep, and he's done, then you know, okay, you better top up your uh, analgesia. On the other side, if he's just going the same way he was going with that kind of dose of opioid, then you know 
yeah, that was a bit overdone, but on the other side, it is only short acting, then you can use your dexmedetomidine again. My last source is usually reversing the um, opioids. So if you have a very monotone, dysphoric um, animal waking up, titrate your naloxone though. Don't just give them the full dose. You don't want to reverse all the analgesia. All you want to reverse is that excitatory part of it. So titrate until he goes to, okay, now I don't care, but at least I'm not painful now. Okay, so now I usually just put 0.1 mils of naloxone into one mil of saline or one mil of naloxone into 10 mils of saline and give it slowly to affect and see where I get with that one. Because if you give a full reversal and he was actually painful and not um, excited, then what you're gonna do? You can't give another opioid on top of that. That naloxone is still floating around, right? And then you're gonna be really into a, in a limbo. And then when you keep continuing um, looking at assessing the pain, it's really hard because the pain scales are all, they're nice, they're cute, they're great, but they don't really work for like 100%. There's not a perfect one around. I said we still should all use them just to see the trend, just to see and, and kind of figure out, you know, what are the signs of pain. If you look, for example, at that guy, He's sitting in the corner, oh, he's a bit dark there, but he's a little duxy and he's in the far corner and he's sitting down, he's not really kind of like lying down relaxed, he's all guarding himself. I'm not sure I wanna touch him. But looking at that, I'm like, he's painful, give him something and then see if he's gonna relax. So these little signs. The problem with those scales is we still see the physiologic values on there. And you remember, heart rate is not an indicator for pain. If you post-operative, his heart rate is down, yeah, you might have given him dexmedetomidine, and that might be reason enough to get his heart rate down. Doesn't mean he doesn't have any pain. Not every ho dog animal responds with a high heart rate, meaning he's painful. Some get really bradycardic with pain. So don't rely on just heart rate. Look at all the different kind of posture, behavior, things. Um, good. The last thing that always comes up is, okay, I can handle him in the clinic because I can give him injections, right? I can totally titrate everything, but what do I do to send him home with? I did a TPLO and I don't have anything to really send him home with. And we, everybody sends everything home on tramadol because it's cheap, it's not controlled, you can give it, but we don't actually know if it works. Butch Kukinich, he is a pharmacologist from Kansas. I worked with him in North Carolina. He's one of the most amazing clinical pharmacologists I've met. He has a very good understanding of like, okay, it is actually not just the theory, what I do in my lab, but what do we actually do in the clinics? And so he did a very good review paper and I recommend that highly to read through that about all the things that we can do for oral mm -hmm. Um, outpatient analgesia. So NSAIDs, yes, it works great and it's very well tolerated in most of our patients. But there is that small percentage that we can't give them NSAIDs because of the adverse effect. And there is the percentage that don't respond to either a specific NSAIDs or general, it is just he's too painful to respond to an NSAID. It's just not enough, right? So we have to look at other potential alternative therapies. So um, the one thing about that is you really need to know your pharmacokinetics for those specific drugs, which is a bit hard one. The first one you really want to know if you want to give an oral drug, is it even taken up? Like codeine, for example, 4% is taken up, right? Like everything else is just, you know, first pass effect, it's a metabolite. It doesn't even work because it was 4% from what you gave as a tablet, you're not gonna get anywhere. Acetaminophen is another one. Yes, you have 50% oral bioavailability, so it is getting absorbed, but it has a very fast um, half-life. So the elimination half-life is about, what is it, an hour? So that means you have to give it every four hours to actually have an effect, which is not really practical. But it's just something to keep in mind, right? And we don't read that stuff because it's boring. We're like, yes, somebody told me I can give, let's say, tramadol again. But, you know, we don't really actually know. Um, the pharmacodynamics means any side effects, but as well is the analgesic effect actually even there. Um, and because we don't have a good way of assessing pain, any pharmacodynamic study or analgesic study 
I'm sorry, they're great, and I'm really glad everybody did them, but they don't, they're meaningless. If you don't have at least five people looking at it and all agreeing on the same one, we don't have a way to assess pain, so we can't say it works or doesn't work. We can kind of think, but there's no evidence, real evidence, that any of those drugs work because we have no way of actually assessing pain, unfortunately, yet. I hope we will soon, though. And with all the facial expressions, I think we're getting a bit closer in the videotaping, but unfortunately, there's nothing there. So what we have left is clinical impressions and a lot of strong opinions. And you read them anywhere, even from me, you hear them now. Um, but in general, that's all we have, and that is very unreliable, right? There's a lot of bias there. Um, there's a lot of placebo effect from the owners as well as the veterinarians because you want it to work. So you want it to work, you, you kind of think it works, but it's your subjective bias or placebo effect. So just keep that a little bit in mind. I don't want to be negative, but you want to be very critical. Um, the options are, we always kind of like, we use this one for a long time, the transdermal um, fentanyl. So we're covering the next couple days with something that seems to be working. We do see a lot of side effects with it, but fentanyl is very lipid soluble, so it has a low molecular weight and it's easy for transdermal um, delivery. There's different sizes and there's two different types. There's a reservoir delivery system, which always comes with problems because you can cut it open and get that fentanyl and sell it on the street, or the matrix delivery system, which kind of has it sitting in the matrix so you can't actually get to it and you have a slow delivery. It is more expensive or people don't really use it, um, but it has definitely less abuse potential. Um, again, the, the absorption is very variable. It depends where you put it and it depends on cat or dog and then it has, like all, most of those drugs, inter-individual differences. So you're gonna have to look at the animal and say, does it seem to work or not? So you, when you use it and you know it's gonna take six to 24 hours to actually make it work, reassess and see if he seems to be painful or not. Duration is um, variable as well. Dogs a bit shorter than cats. And then the problem is the toxicity. So I usually don't recommend it for anybody who has ch small children at home because if they pull it off, we know that the opioids have a strong respiratory depressant effect in humans. If they get contaminated with that, you might see some real problems. Um, there is, um, just did that one, sorry. The buprenorphine patches are other ones um, that kind of seem to be around. There's different sizes on that. Absorption, very variable, and there's no analgesia study at all to look if they seem to be working. Um, it'd be great if they do, and if we find a good study to kind of look at it, I probably would recommend that one for moderate pain, but right now there is no good study to, to show us if they do work. Tramadol, finally getting to it. Considered an atypical opioid in humans. Um, and when we look at the pharmacokinetics, the, the very important thing is the metabolites. They, in humans, we have about 30 metabolites. Dogs make about 26, cats about 27. Um, and the active drugs are tr the parent drug tramadol comes as a racemic mixture of a positive and a negative one, and you have them sitting there. And then we have an M1 and an M5 metabolite. So the tramadol itself, the parent drug, works as the alpha-2 receptors, serotonin reuptake inhibition, remember the descending pathway, no epinephrine effects, again, descending pathway, and has some very mild opioid activity. Um, the negative, uh, where's my mouse here, is um, alpha-2 effects again. The M1 metabolite is that it, in humans has the strong mu opioid activity. Strong is overrated, it has a high affinity, but has a weak intrinsic activity. Um, and then the, M, the negative version, again, has the muscarinic and the alpha-2 effect. And the M5 metabolite has some of the serotonin and norepinephrine effect. So now the only problem with that, which is great for humans, it works as an opioid. In dogs and any other species, we actually don't know what kind of metabolites they make. From a couple studies, it doesn't look like the dogs make the M1 metabolite. So it does not work as an opioid. It works on all the other, norepinephrine, serotonin, 
but it has no opioid activity or very minimal. So for acute pain, probably not ideal in dogs, right? For chronic pain, it's a whole different story. Okay, I'm kind of a bit scared you're making, taking a picture there. <laughs> So for chronic pain, because of the serotonin and the norepinephrine um, effect, I would say totally use it. I think it has its place. But if you're sending your TPLO home of it because you know you want the opioid effect, and I often get that question, can we use hydro and tramadol together? I'm like, yeah, and a dog, like, why are you even worried? Because they don't make that M1 metabolite. And then the other thing to remember, look at the dosing. The half-life is about an hour. In humans, it's five hours. So yeah, they give it once a day. But in dogs, you kind of have to give it pretty much every six to eight hours to actually get that effect. Unless you want to just give it, okay, now he seems painful. Now I'm treating it. But if you want to maintain that analgesia postoperatively, then you're going to have to give it more frequently. And then the other thing they seem to be showing is if you give it too long, somehow the plasma concentration decreases. And I don't really, they don't know where it's coming from, if it's a decreased drug absorption over time or a pre systemic um, metabolism that seems to be happening over time. So if you give it too long, we have some of that. Cats, on the other side, they make lots of M1 metabolites. So it works great as an opiate for those ones. So I think it has a stronger role there, and which is great because with cats, we always struggle what to give. <coughs> the only problem is they taste crappy and bitter, and cats pilling is one thing. Um, so, you know, ideally, they want to come up with a more palatable um, tablet, but the, um, like the, the opioid activity as well as the uh, um, chronic pain activity it works, seems to be working well. And it has a longer half-life in cats too, so you can actually give it every 12 hours, so that seems to so be quite happy. There's one study, obviously, like, you got my opinion, and I might be wrong, in, ten, in five years somebody might be saying whatever she said was totally wrong, it works great for acute pain, but I, right now, I don't think it works well for acute pain, but it is useful for chronic pain. Um, there's one good study that seemed to be fairly um, well done and that looked at NSAIDs and tramadol together and you have a very strong analgesic synergistic effect. The only thing you want to remember is that the tramadol has the serotonin enhanced gastric acid secretion, the NSAID has GI issues in combination, you really want to look out for the GI of that animal if you give that for a long time together. So any gastric protective agents might be happy. Right now, tramadol is not a control <laughs> drug. I think it'll change. It's already changed in some of the um, United States states. Um, so I think it'll come to our way too. Because of the opioid activity for humans, it, will, it has abuse um, potential. <coughs> so just to go back to this one, we do have the parent drug that works on serotonin as well as norepinephrine and the um, adrenergic effect perfect for chronic pain. It will be probably a good one to use for that. But you are dependent on the M1 metabolite to uh, um, get the opioid effect. Gabapentin, another really good drug that we don't know much about. Um, anticonvulsant, we don't know about the mechanism. It seems to have some GABA activity, looks like a GABA, um, increases GABA concentration in the brain. Um, and it also is somewhat related to the calcium channels. And calcium receptors channels are very important for pain in the central, um, in the CNS. So it seems to be effective for neuropathic pain in humans. For shingles, it's one of those what it's like used for or kind of like gets the FDA approval for. Um, so for chronic neurologic kind of neuropathic pain, it seems to be effective. In the veterinary studies, there's no evidence at all that it, is an, it has an analgesic effect. So now I can say that that could be because we can't assess, especially chronic pain, that we don't see the analgesic effect. Same with the acupuncture. It's hard to assess if the analgesia actually works because we have no way of assessing pain, as I said before. But when they give it preemptively for acute pain, there seems to be no difference um, or it seems to be no effect for acute pain. So I think its role would be the chronic pain again. Any upregulation of the pain pathway, you probably get an effect of gabapentin. Um, but sending everything home on gabapentin and tramadol for acute pain, probably not ideal. 
Again, the uh, half-life is very short, so giving it once a day won't be enough. You probably need to give it every eight hours, six to eight hours. And then we don't really, and that's just to keep that target concentration high that works for humans, but we do not know what the target concentration needs to be in animals. So we extrapolate from the humans, but we don't know. Oral opioids, forget about them. Unfortunately, the bioavailability is low. It's 15% for most of them, as be even on the extended release ones. So if 15% of whatever you're giving is getting to anything, I, don't, I think that's kind of not enough. Um, I know we used to give butorphanol orally. That has about a 4% bioavailability, so it really doesn't work. Um, so not, not really helpful, unfortunately, at all. It would be great um, because that's our only options. We can't really send anything home with the syringe to inject, but from the bioavailability, like just from looking at the pharmacokinetics, it doesn't seem to work. Amantadine is another, that seems to be where there's some studies out there. Again, it's an NMDA antagonist, so it works for chronic and severe pain. Um, it works great in humans, but the problem is um, there's some pharmacokinetic studies in, uh, in, um, in animals, so sh short duration for dogs, um, but very good bio availability for cats if you want to give it orally. So if you have any very chronic animals like osteoarthritis patients, they're probably a very good choice. Again, there's no really a good analgesic study to be able to tell us it is working. Um, so that's when you kind of go back to, um, okay, my clinical impression seems to be he's better. I just told you that's not the best way, but it's the only way you have. And you looked at that animal, you know that animal, the owners are happier, um, I guess you're just going to have to stick with that one, unfortunately. Um, other modalities, and I think, you know, when you look at the pain clinics, that's a pain clinic in Toronto, um, we need to branch out a little bit from the just pillum and fillum kind of thing, right? So we just kind of have to look at, hey, what's all in there? This is a chronic pain kind of center in, in Toronto. What how do they have there? They have a psychiatrist there, right? I mean, yes, and some of our animals might need one of those, but in general, <laughs> It's the owners, but there's acupuncture, chiropractic, massage therapy. And the thing is that, you know, they are quite helpful, like especially those manual therapies, like the physiotherapy. If you have a fracture, a TPLO, there's no reason not to send them to the physiotherapist um, because you're going to start getting the um, range of motion back. You're kind of like manipulating the muscles. They're not as spazzy again, like, and you kind of like smoothen things out. And that all comes back to that A beta fibers, right? You want those ones starting to go to the dorsal horn and saying, you know what? You guys back off a little bit on the A delta and C fiber activity there. Let me go in and kind of diminish things a little bit. It, just from the principle, it seems to be very good about enhancing circulation and preventing the joints from moving, right? Everybody who had a joint surgery, you know you gotta keep it moving, otherwise you're gonna get a really decreased range of motion. So rehab, I think, especially if it comes for swimming, that's 4-4, very kind of like useful. Massages as well, range of motions on um, the other one there. So massages is what owners can do too, right? So you kind of like all that manipulation and getting the lymph activity going, and even for cancer pain, like yes, you might not be ma massaging the, pain, the, the cancer area, but the rest of the body, just to keep that innoxious stimulus going to the dorsal horn, the good kind of stuff that goes to the dorsal horn to diminish the other um, activity. Um, and it releases the endorphins. Remember how in the, do in the um, dorsal horn, the endorphins have a strong role of modulating whatever comes to the dorsal horn to actually inhibit it a little bit. So endorphins are good for that. You don't have to give them opioids for that. Obviously, some of them need that, but just the manipulation of that, so all that wishy-washy stuff is probably actually not as bad as we kind of think. We're all scientists. We all want to just give drugs and stuff, but, you know, the whole, like, in, and, and empowering the owners to get, say, you know what, if you ice them every evening, they have, they have a role, they feel better that they can do something about it. Weight loss, we all know that obesity is a huge problem for chronic systemic inflammation. So you already have inflammation, now you have more pain towards it. So yes, um, definitely wanna get rid of that one, right? 
again, helps with range of motion. It's very um, thermotherapy, an easy one. Just put heat on. If you have osteoarthritis, put them on a heating blanket or put like some heat on the hip area for a lot of like, again, the owners like to do something for the animals, easy one to empower them. Um, laser is another one that people are kind of starting to use. No studies to look at if it's working or not. Um, mm. Same with that tense, like that. But, th but just the principle of just loosening up the muscles, it's just um, stimulation of the muscle that might help for muscular skeletal pain. Not for neuropathic or cancer pain, but for uh, muscular skeletal pain and recovery, it does seem to be improving healing. Acupuncture, okay, I, like, I'm biased on that one because I do, I'm certified and I do love it, um, but it's more common, like you see, like most, like, in, in one of your, who, who in, blah, blah, blah. does anybody in your clinic uses acupuncture at all? Or any physiotherapy, see, there's like um, some of them, so it is more common, Nor like I think we're still in North America, about 20 years behind Europe, where you kind of like um, use it as it's just integral part of it, and it can play a huge role in like inflammatory and chronic pain as well as acute pain. Um, and it's just that no, even if you just look at it from a like, you know, endorphin release or a tonin release, you can get some a response from that one. So when you kind of look at the, the percutaneous needling, again, it's the A beta fiber, a, a beta fibers that you want to get going, right? So you stimulate those ones, but they don't cause any pain. They kind of inhibit the activity of the eight delta fibers. Um, and they kind of decrease the inhibitory neurons as well. So in general, you guys kept with me, I'm very impressed. Um, I think pain management remains a huge challenge in veterinary medicine, mainly due to the fact that we have no real tools to assess pain um, in animals. So that way we can't really assess if analgesics are working. Um, but on the other side, you're going to have to remember that every animal is, cr is very individual to their experience <coughs> of pain, so you can't just use one protocol for everything. You really have to titrate it to the specific animal, and that is even more so a big problem for chronic pain. And understanding that physiology and that pathway, like just read it up again, gives you like more power to figure out why are we using certain drugs, right? So keep informed with what comes out for pharmacokinetics and don't just follow whatever people say about, you know, recommendations. Be very critical about it, but also be open-minded. Don't always go, well, that doesn't work, I'm not going to use it, or say, well, that's the only thing that works. Be very critical, but very open-minded and figure out for yourself what seems to be working or what not. So again, I recommend that book highly, and I really appreciate your patience, especially with that little glitch.